it's so great to be back in the UK. I really love coming here. I want to talk today about art direction, but I should start with a confession that in, for a long time I didn't really know what art direction is. I mean, of course I know what art direction is. Art direction is that guy's job. Right, like you sit at a table and you direct the art. You make sure everything looks good. You make sure everything stays on brand. But uh, I, I was working on a particular project and I sort of had this idea, this sort of epiphany about how art direction isn't cool, about what art direction is. That it really is about being in a conversation with your audience and making deliberate choices in order to have that conversation. So I just put up four slides for you. They're typeset in Helvetica. Why? Because I'm talking about modern art, and everything having to do with modern art should be in Helvetica. Uh, I had an idea, so I got a light bulb, a clip art light bulb for you, and I made my slide yellow to match my light bulb. This is, do this is dorky. This is not what. But as you were looking at those slides, whether you thought something in your mind or not, you, were, you had some sort of impression of me or what the talk was going to be like just based on the way that I typeset and colored those slides. This is much more up my alley. I mean, I stopped in the middle of the street because I thought this building was so beautiful, and I thought um, I wanted to take a photograph of it. So maybe I should make my slides be something more that is my own personal style. And if I look at the keynote deck options, you know, I could choose this one. But this is not really the story that I, I'm here to tell you today. This is very weak. This would be sort of like, meh, we're doing arts and crafts. Let me show you some stuff. It's not really the message I want to give you. This is much more along the lines of what I want to talk about. This sort of evokes feelings of, you know, of a Vogue magazine or really great design coming from magazines. That, so that process of thinking through, what is it that I really want to say? What is it that I want to give off? What sort of subconscious feelings do I want to evoke? What other things that are out there do I want to be associated associated with, and making deliberate choices, that's art direction. Editorial design is another great phrase that you might want to tuck away as a, over the next year or two as you're trying to figure out what kind of layouts to do. Um, you can search on that phrase and find great books and other kinds of things. Um, there's a great book that I really like uh, called Editorial Design, and in it they say, the vast majority of editorial has at its heart the idea of communicating an idea of a story through the organization and presentation of words and visuals. The idea of communicating the idea of the story through visuals and through layout. I don't think we really do that much in the tech industry. And some of you might be thinking, well, I don't do editorial. I'm not going to design a newspaper website. We have an app. It's special. It's different. It's an app. All of these things apply to something you might call an app as well, um, or what we used to call uh, computer programs. <laughs> um, if you could see it, is this, do we need to do something about this projector? You're working on it. Okay. Um, if you could see it, the slide on the left, and by the way, all these slides, I just tweeted the link out to them. So if you want to pull them up, you can um, go find me on Twitter, Jen Simmons, and I, um, about, I don't know, three minutes ago, a link went out to these slides. Um, the one on the left is uh, Google Docs. And the feeling that you get when you go to Google Docs, both from the layout and from the typography, and the, there's not very much on the page at all, but the little bit you get from there, it sort of conveys the sense of, this is a very safe place for you. You can put your stuff here, and when you come back, it will still be here. Uh, we're very functional and practical, and this is a good place to do work with your colleagues. Right. If you use a program called Byword, which is there on the right, um, it gives you much more a feeling of, hello, author. You're here to write something very special. We're going to be very quiet now. Almost nothing on the page. And those two different ideas are being conveyed. The idea of communicating the idea of the story through the organization and presentation of words and visuals. There's this uh, magazine that's in the book that has, there's a couple layouts. So this is the first, the beginning of it, and then there's this layout. This article is about architecture in Asia and China. And it's about, I mean, you can just, without reading anything, you can get the feeling from this that it's sort of about um, pride and the new things that are happening in Asia. And that you can see in the photographs these tall, strong buildings. And then you can see in the way the text laid, is laid out and the spacing between the text and the photographs, this sort of sense of structure and strength and 
feeling, right? And then you get to the website, and the website doesn't have any of that. The website's very chaotic. The, the website sort of screams, hi, I'm a website. I'm laid out like this. Um, because we got into this rut where we feel like all websites need to be laid out like that. Or these days, like this. You may have seen this going around Twitter. We are unique. Find out how unique. This is your website. Uh, the content, you know, your business is so incredibly unique, but your content is not. Um, you, you, your layout is the same as everybody else's layout. Or this. John Gold tweeted, which of one of these two possible websites are you currently designing? <laughs> We're so incredibly bored. I'm sorry, this is really driving me crazy. And all the technicians left. All right, so anyway, we're completely bored with web design. We don't know what it is that we're, um, what we want to be doing anymore. And, and then some people have said, well, we're bored because of it's responsive web design's fault. Responsive web design has made layouts really boring. And I don't think it's responsive web design's fault at all. I think it's our fault. Um, we're using a lot of tools, uh, tools that sort of have their origin back in 960 grid. Who used 960 grid? Uh, back in the day, right? And we got into this habit of doing 12 columns where every column is the same width as every other column. And then we've been, uh, st we've stuck with that grid. We've been, whole entire industry is using this one grid. And when Flexbox came out, uh, when responsive design came along, there was a whole bunch of new frameworks that came to replace 960 grid because 960 grid was fixed width. And we had got uh, all these different versions of a responsive layout framework, but it was always the same. It was always the same 12 column grid. And then Bootstrap has come along, and Bootstrap really is. Um, a tool that a lot of people use, and it, it comes with these layouts that are really the same exact grids frame uh, system, and then um, these layouts. There's these these different layouts that you can choose, and these are the layouts that we've been using quite a lot. Um, I really believe that layout shouldn't be a multiple choice question. Layout should be an essay question. You should figure out what kind of layout is going to best convey your site, your project, your app, whatever it is that you're doing. And, and that you should create tools or use tools that are going to help you convey that design. And maybe you need a style guide. You need a style framework. You need your own custom framework. Maybe you want to take Bootstrap and crack it open, throw out the parts you're not using, and hack it and change it. Um, I'm all for that. But we're, I think we're in this weird period where we've let the tools dictate all the designs for us. And when Flexbox came along, we got all these like even more different um, frameworks that are all basically the exact same design done in Flexbox. So what are we going to do if we don't use other people's designs? Um, I've been doing a lot of research over the last year into graphic design history and how it could be impacting the web. And there's a lot of great books out there. This is one of them, um, Grids and Page Layouts. Uh, and in it, this book, they say, hey, you can use negative space as a map. You can use negative space to guide people's eyes and guide what's going on with the readers and get them to be where it is that you want them to be. There's this other book, Layout Essentials, 100 Design Principles for Using Grids. I really like this book as well. And in it, one tip, create an oasis. The web is so busy and crowded. People are so frantic surfing the web. You can start creating spaces on your web pages where Things are calmer, where you can actually create an oasis for people. There's an amazing future coming in layout design. Uh, here's the official timeline. <laughs> we started out with no layouts, because we had absolutely no tools for doing layout at all. Every page had a gray background, <laughs> and everything was in one column. Uh, and then we started using tables for layout. Uh, and we got these kind of punk rock designs that people were doing for a while. Then we hand-coded floats. We've liked the Holy Grail layout quite a bit in that era. Um, framework layouts started uh, getting us into this era where everything seems to be shaped in this shape where, like, you could take a... You, if you could take the website and fold it in half, everything would just be, like, mere images of the other. And, uh, and then we've got a kitten that's a unicorn that's coming in our future. And I think we also have non-flashing slides going in our future. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So I have a bunch of examples to show you. You can see them at labs.jensimmons.com. They're up right now. And I'm going to show you some big pieces and little pieces of what is possible. The technology, there's new technology coming along that makes things possible that were not possible before. 
Initial letter is one of them. So here in this design from print, you can see that, oh my gosh, the paragraph where people are supposed to read is not at the top left corner of the page. You know what? You can put things on other places on the page. You don't have to start everything in the top left corner. The headline is not in the top left corner. But people are not confused. They know where to go because of visual hierarchy and because of the use of the drop cap. There are ways to do this uh, in graphic design. So what do we do for drop caps on the web? Well, we uh, do our best. We isolate things with a pseudo element first letter. That's cool. We'll keep doing that. That works. And then when we grab that letter, what do we do? We say font size 2M, no, 4M, no, 2.39M, no, 2.836M. OK, perfect in my favorite browser. Now look at in the other browser. Oh, it totally doesn't line up anymore. I like the one on the right there. They just sort of said, yeah, it's never going to line up because browsers size things differently. And there's no consistency. So we'll just make a giant space and call it art. But there's a new property coming. It's called initial letter. And this will take all of that complexity away. You, instead of saying font size, bigger, bigger, please, oh, it's not really what I need, you can just say initial letter four. And the computer will do the math. Computers are good at math. And it will figure out, how do I make this letter be exactly four lines of text? And that's what it will do. If the user changes the font size, or the line height gets changed later by somebody else, or the font doesn't download, or anything happens, it's still going to be the proper height. It's still going to line up. So let's see, I want to use this today. It only works in Safari 9 and 10. That's maybe 12 or 13% of the global market. So uh, what happens in other browsers? Well, if you understand progressive enhancement, you realize, well, just pretend that that doesn't exist. We'll cross it out and think through what happens in browsers where they don't understand this property. Uh, yeah, that's not what I want. Because it applied the color and the font weight and the little bit of margin in a situation where I don't want it. So does that mean I have to wait until every browser supports initial letter before I can use it? No. There's a thing called a feature query where you can drop an at support statement into your code. So I took the font color change and the bold and the margin right along with the initial letter. I wrapped it all up in this conditional, this little test in CSS. I'm going to leave JavaScript out of this. I could have used Modernizer back in the day, but I don't want to use Modernizer. It's too complicated. So I'm just going to do this all in my CSS. I can say at support initial letter or WebKit initial letter, because there is a prefix and I need to test for both. Uh, and let me check out, OK, well, if those things are supported, it's going to run this code. And if those things are not supported, or if I'm in a browser that doesn't know what at supports is, like IE11, it will just skip the whole block of code, which is fine, because that's what I want anyway. I want this code to get skipped. IE11 doesn't know initial letter, and it never, ever, ever, ever will. So it's fine. Um, this is called a feature query, and it works like this. It's a lot like a media query in its shape. S at supports, property value, and you need both a property and a value. And you put a bunch of CSS in there. Um, and I think we're going to make heavy use of this next year when CSS Grid starts shipping. And we're going to be able to say, hey, I got a bunch of code that I want you to run if you don't know Grid. Or everybody's going to run it because it's not inside a statement, a, at support statement. Everybody run this code. And then if you understand Grid, I want you to like undo a few things because you know that's how it's going to work. And then I want you to hear some new code. I want you to run this code. Um, it makes it possible to write a layout using Grid even though Grid's not going to be in every browser instantaneously on a special day next year. I wrote a big article about this with lots more detail if you want to read it. Um, again, these slides are up. You can find them, and you can find the links to this. Um, viewport units is another property that uh, I think is pretty amazing. Um, so that example on the right there, no matter how big somebody's browser window is, that headline in the photo behind the headline, the dirt, is exactly the size of the viewport. And the moment that a user starts scrolling, the article is right there. So they're never going to be confused. They're just going to start scrolling, and boom, nice. How did I do that? I did that by setting a fixed height on the header element of 100 VH. 100 VH is 100 viewport height units. Kind of like percent, except it works vertically, which percents don't. Um, I also put a display flex and a margin auto, display flex on the header and a margin auto on the H1, because this, uh, Flexbox redefines what margin auto does, and it makes margin auto vertically center this headline. Couple lines of code, amazing. Viewport height units and width units. You can use them any place that you might use an M, a rem, a percent, or a pixel. You can use VH or VW, and it measures the viewport and does basically 1% for each unit. 
uh, or v min v max, where it looks at the two values and it picks the smaller one of the two or the larger one of the two. And what this means is that for the first time ever, we can start designing something in space. We, can, we don't have to cram everything really tight. We can create some bigger white space and we can place something with a knowledge of where the four edges are of the screen, of the viewport, which means that the fold actually does exist. <laughs> we can actually design things knowing where the fold is for the first time. Object fit is another one of my favorite properties these days. Back in the day, if you put an image on the page, the image was the size of the image in pixels. That's what used to be simple, back in the simple days. And when the responsive web design, we're doing uh, with 100%, which means that the image stretches, or in this case, it's actually 50%, the image is going to stretch based on the amount of space that it has. And at the same time, the height changes because the aspect ratio is being maintained. Right? So we're used to this. It works well. But maybe you want to do a layout. A lot of the layouts I've been doing lately, I kind of want to set my image in both directions. I want the height to be 50% of the viewport. I want the height to have to do with the content that it's near. So what happens if I do that and I put a property, you know, I specify sizing in both directions in an image? Well, traditionally, this is what happens. And poor Grace Hopper has her face all smushed. That's not acceptable. What I really want to do is maintain the aspect ratio of the image and maintain both the height and the width of the box and crop it. Thus, object fit cover. I can apply this property object fit to this image, and I can say, you know, please go ahead and uh, crop it for me. It doesn't work for every use case, or sometimes when you don't want to crop an image, that's cool. But if, you, if it works out, if this is a good use for you for this particular whatever you're doing, then it's a great little tool. You can also use object position to, right now it's, it's centering her at 50-50, right? A dot in the middle is the center and is cropping evenly on all four sides. But you can use object position to move that dot and crop on one side or the other. So there it is, width 50%, height 400, object fit, cover. There's also a whole bunch of tools that I'll just mention without really having any time to, to explain them, where um, you can, you know, by default, everything you ever put on the web is a square or a rectangle. It's a rectangular in shape. But we have tools now where you can break up those rectangles, where you can cut the edges of a box into a polygon or into some sort of a shape where you can use masks and change it into some sort of a mask, where you can float an object and have the flow content that goes around it flow around in a shape, like a circle. Um, we don't have to have everything be box, 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 box. There's lots of tools. You can also use a gradient like, that has basically two, like, two solid colors and not an actual gradient to create a slice in something. Um, so we've got these pieces, and we can assemble them together. We've got drop and raised caps. We've got non-rectangular shapes. We've got image size in both dimensions. And we've got sizing based on edges. All things that we've never even considered before, we can actually start doing. And this code is supported well enough that if you know how to progressively enhance your CSS, you can start using this today. And then there are big pieces, some of which I'm sure you've heard of, some of which maybe you have or haven't. Um, really, the big pieces are Flexbox and CSS Grid. How many people have heard of CSS Grid? And how many people have coded anything experiments in CSS Grid? <laughs> so Flexbox, uh, we've been trying to get Flexbox to do what we really want CSS Grid to do. And people are frustrated and confused because they're like, how come this tool isn't what I need it to be? And the answer is because that's not the purpose of that tool, sadly. Um, it came first, so we were using it as kind of a stopgap, but that's not really what it's for. Flexbox likes to think of the world in one dimension. It likes to think of the world as one giant row or one giant column. And maybe that one giant row wraps, but when it does wrap and Flexbox comes along and starts doing calculations based on the information that you gave it, it will um, calculate each row independently. There's no way to get things to line up from one row to the other row. It will like, calculate this row, and then it will calculate that row. It works great for certain use cases, like a navigation bar or a toolbar on some sort of app. Or There's lots and lots and lots and lots of places where Flexbox is very powerful. Um, but creating a big layout is not one of them. If you tell Flexbox it will think about the world as a giant column, and it will wrap if whatever it's in is, has a, some sort of a cap, a fixed height, or some sort of a percent height, but that not, not infinite. Um, 
and it will calculate the sizes of those boxes each independently in each row. There's interesting things we could be doing with Flexbox that we're not. We're busy trying to force Flexbox to be 960 grid, <laughs> um, which it's not. Uh, but CSS grid layout is really the tool that's going to blow everyone's minds and change the way that we do grid layouts. Um, CSS grid thinks about the world in two dimensions. It thinks about both rows and columns at the same time. And if something's going on in one of the rows or columns, it can transfer that information into the other rows and columns both simultaneously. And you can do amazing layouts. Um, We've, if you've ever tried to use Flexbox to do a layout like this, have you had this problem where if you have an, a fewer than, like if you have four across all the way down, but at the bottom you only have two, then those two grow to be the w full width, and you're like, why is it doing that? And then you have to like write all these uh, widths and all these media queries and all this code that you, no, grid, grid is the, the tool to be using for that job. And you can accomplish this in very little code. But grid is also powerful in that you don't have to have all your columns be the same width or identical ratios, you know, they, can, they don't have to be the same as each other. Um, you also don't have to fill your cells with your content. Grid has a very different mental model than the tools that we've been using. And I want everyone to, I'm hoping people will start to really understand the different mental model and not just try to use Grid the same way you've been using tools like Bootstrap, but figure out how Grid actually can do lots of other things. And one of them is, um, you know, a lot of the tools we've been using, sort of the content in a cell and the cell itself are this one and the same. And in Grid, they're not. They're separate. Um, you can then use these properties to get things to not necessarily be at the top of a cell. They could be in the middle of the cell. They could be at the bottom of the cell. They could be aligned to the right of the cell. If you've used Flexbox, these things might seem familiar to you, these alignment properties, like justify content, justify... Um, Align content, justify, uh, align self, align items, these things from Flexbox, they have grown and they got out of the Flexbox spec and worked their way over the alignment spec and they've worked their way into grid. There's going to be six of them and there are ways that you can then align things and tell things where to be inside the box that they're in. Um, so one great thing to do right now is to spend time investing uh, in Flexbox, in learning these alignment properties. It's one of the things that's hard about Flexbox, remembering what justify self means versus justify items versus align self versus align items versus, wait, what was the other one again? Um, so there's a couple games out there that you can use to like drill yourself, um, maybe make some flashcards. <laughs> like it's time to, to memorize these things. Um, but you can do layouts like this with Grid because Grid has rows. And when I first heard of rows, I thought, oh, that would be nice for lining things up across the thing. But as I've started to use Grid, I've realized really the profound thing about Grid is that it makes it possible to have white space. And in this example, I've said, okay, that one box that's sort of floating around, I want you to be in these, this area, this group of four cells, and I want you to place yourself in the center of that area. You can't do that with something like uh, Bootstrap. Or you could have nothing in the top row and have white space. I've started to realize that floats are kind of like having a bathtub full of hundreds of bars of soap, where all the bars of soap are like floating up to the top of the water, and they're competing with each other. And responsive web design just like rearranges all the bars of soap, and they just sort of float back around, and they're cramming themselves. Grid isn't like that. Grid, you can actually tell things to be somewhere on the page and have white space. There are many ways to use CSS Grid. This is similar to the kinds of things we're used to with Bootstrap and 960 Grid and all the tools that came in between, where you have items and you tell them where to be. You say, I want this thing here, I want that thing there, I want this other thing here. I've been looking at a lot of books uh, and I saw this poster on the right and I thought, oh my gosh, is that a thing for CSS Grid? Could I code that with CSS Grid? So uh, I did. <laughs> and if you notice, the headline was not at the very top of the page. I actually had content above the headline. And then, the, and you could still see that. You, your eyeballs find the headline just fine. It's not a big deal to not have the headline at the very top of the page. Now, this is a literal translation of the poster. So it kind of makes no sense to have the logo on the bottom. And it, there's a little, there's some bugs in it and stuff. But just as an experiment to see what's possible. So when I did this, the very first thing I did is um, I wrote the HTML for it. 
I wrote out what should the order be of this content. The, the logo should be first. The name should be second. Then it should say spring 2017. Then it should say schedule of events, which is a phrase that does not appear visually in any of the designs. It only appears in the DOM for people using a screen reader or for people for whom the CSS has, has fallen off the page. And you might think, who uses the web without CSS? Actually, you have no idea how many users of yours use the web without your CSS. People are using things like Instapaper and Pocket and Readability. They're clicking the reader mode in their browser and like just looking at the page without, without all the crap, right? There's no stats on that. Google Analytics doesn't tell you how many people are doing that. All of those people are using the web without your CSS. And if, it, if Cortana or Siri or uh, the Amazon Echo ever wakes up one day and starts reading web pages aloud to people or reading p web pages out loud in people's cars, then there's going to be a lot of people having a oral uh, experience of the web, and getting yourself set up to handle that now is, is a good idea. Um, so source order matters. Your HTML matters. Your semantics matter. And the great thing about Grid is that your source order can be what it should be based on what your content is. And then your layout can be whatever you want, because you can rearrange everything using Grid. So then I wrote a, f a, lay a layout using floats, using technology that every browser understands these days. It's not as pretty as the other one, but it works just fine. Um, and then I went ahead and applied using the at support, so I applied my grid. So it kind of overrides some of the layout that was the float-based layout, and then it uh, makes a much better experience. So you know, right now, nobody has a browser that uses grid, but as more and more and more people do, everybody could use this web page, and more and more people will see the great design. So grid, on the one hand, you can place each item into a specific air space on the cell, in the, on the grid, into a particular cell or into a particular area. And on the other hand, you can do something that no framework that we use today does, which is you can have the browser figure out where to put everything. It will auto-place everything for you. And you can use that algorithm and write much less code. So here's an example. This is a fairly standard layout. It's a bunch of squares in rows, right? I mean, you can, for those of you who do write CSS, you know how much code this takes to do with floats or how much code this might take to do with Flexbox. Especially with responsive design, there's a bunch of media queries. There's my uh, HTML, right? It's a bunch of images. I put them in figures. It's just a list. There is all the CSS running on this example. Not all the layout CSS. This is all the CSS. Seven lines of CSS for this entire page. This is all of the layout CSS. Basically, one line to say, hey, I'm going to use Grid, and one line to do the entire layout. Grid is awesome. <laughs> grid was designed with responsive web design in mind. In this line of code, basically, I'm saying, hello, computer, who's good at math. I want you to figure out things. I want you to repeat this pattern I'm going to tell you. Auto fit is I want you to decide how many columns there's going to be, but I want you to go ahead and fit the content. I'm going to have you use the content to figure out how many columns to be. And then I want you to make those columns be this min-max thing. A minimum of 280 pixels and a maximum of 1FR. 1FR meaning, hey, you're just going to take what's there and you're going dis to distribute it equally among yourselves. Go ahead and stretch, distribute whatever you're doing equally among yourselves. Never let the columns be smaller than 280. It's like, OK, and it makes that uh, entire layout. The grid auto placement algorithm is also smart enough in that Spice's example, each of those photos was the same size, and so it just put one in each box, one in each box, one in each box, one in each box. But maybe some of those photos, I put a class on them, and those classes made those bigger in this example here, like the box that has the number four or the number seven in it, those boxes are bigger. Um, the browser will go ahead and start placing things into cells, and when it wants to put something into a cell that's too small, it will just skip that space and go down to the next one and keep going and then find the next biggest, the, the space that's, the next space that's big enough to fit the thing that it has. So this is the default auto placement algorithm. Um, it's in sparse mode. But you can switch to auto grid auto flow dense and then the computer will start rearranging the content to backfill things in and it will fit them into the spaces that are available. No JavaScript. No masonry, no crazy crazy, no slowness, all CSS. It's pretty amazing. So here's an example um, of images, and you can start to see at different breakpoints. But there are no breakpoints at different sizes of the viewport. The images rearrange themselves. 
so thinking back to, to the modernists and to the people who did modern graphic design in the 20th century, um, this painting just kept jumping out at me. Um, and the people in that time were really doing graphic design in a reaction to the Industrial Revolution and as a rejection of what the Victorians had been doing. A lot of people say, well, you know, I don't understand what the big deal is about this. I could draw that. You know, why is this in the museum? I could go home and do this painting in like three hours. What's the... <laughs> but the big deal is that people thought of this in an era when this is what everything <laughs> looked like. And they were exploring, what does it mean to just use boxes? What does that feel like? Well, if, I, if I do some sort of layout like this, or I do some sort of construction like this, what does that do to the people who are looking at this painting? I feel like that's a question for us now. What does it mean to use this space in these kinds of shapes in ways that we are not used to and we haven't been? So I wanted to see, what, do I, what can I do with this Mondrian painting? And it took me a little while to decide how to mark this up. For a while, I thought, well, I'm just going to do a bunch of background images with color blocks or you know, a bunch of empty divs with background color blocks. Like that's, But really, this is a list of pieces of the painting because I wanted to have an accessible experience for people using screen readers. And I'm like, what would be the best experience? I'm like, a poem of names of color. That's what that painting. It should be white, white, yellow, white, white, red, yellow, white, 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 black. That's the, that's the alternative screen reader experience. And so here it is with no layout. I've got all these different pieces of painting that I've cut up, and I use CSS to put a black border on each of them. And then I use grid to lay them out. And I made it responsive. So we have responsive Mondrian. And we can start to see... What does it do? If that was content, if that was a landing page of news articles, what does that feel like? How does that work? What does that give us? I've also become fascinated with, uh, there's a whole series of um, uh, designs from uh, different people throughout Europe, all in the 1920s, mostly 1930s. Um, some of them very famous, some of them not, didn't get nearly as much attention. Uh, but. Fascinating, right? This is my favorite one. So I thought I really needed to redesign the top of my labs.gen Simmons page. I was sort of waiting for inspiration. This is the fallback layout. This is the layout that you'll see if you go to this website with a normal people browser right now today. Um, I could have styled this more and put some red lines and things on it, but I, I don't know. I just kind of was in the mood to leave it simple. And then I applied another layout using grid. So this is a combination of grid to do the layout uh, the of Jen Simmons phrase is rotated using writing modes, which are pretty awesome. And then I use transform rotate to transform it 45 degrees on the wider screens. Really robust code, very simple to write, not hacky. If you wanted to do this with floats and all 100% transform rotates, it'd be really, really tough. So now that you've seen what grid can do, the question always becomes, well, you know, when do I get to use this, right? Where is it right now? How can you have these examples when it's in no browsers? Um, and if you look at uh, can I use, it's really, I see people say things on Twitter or in blog posts that are really depressing. Because I guess if you look at it, this in the normal way of thinking about things, you think, well, it's not here. It's going to take forever. It's going to be three or four years before we can use it. Um, but it's really not true. Flexbox was built, designed, was, um, I'm sorry, Flexbox was implemented in an era where people who are writing these specifications and who are implementing the code in browsers, they, it turns out when things are complicated, like Flexbox or Grid, they need time to try out ideas. They need time to implement things and realize they got it wrong and make adjustments, to take the phrases and the names and the words that they've chosen to use for the properties and the values, and then to change them a couple times. And that happened with Flexbox. It happened when everything was prefixed. And we started, as soon as Flexbox came out prefixed, we were like, awesome, I'm using that today. And then they changed all the terminology in 2012, and we were like, oh my gosh, this is crazy town. Now there's two versions of Flexbox. This is hard. And we've lived with the legacy of that. When people, everybody was working on grid, they sort of said, yeah, that was a mess. Let's not do that again. 
We're not going to prefix any of this. None of Grid is coming out with a prefix. Instead, what's happened is all of the development has happened behind a flag. It's been going on for the last three years, and you just didn't know it. There's been changing of the names. There's been bugs that are getting worked out. There's been all kinds of conversations and details of like, oh my gosh, wait, what about this use case? What are we going to do for that? And all that work's already been done. So yeah, maybe it takes four to five years before you can use something. Guess what? We're already in year almost four. So uh, if you want to check out Grid right now, you can go use uh, Firefox Nightly, Firefox Developer Edition, or Safari Technical Preview. If you download those, uh, those browsers, they just have Grid and it already works. Um, if you want to use Chrome, Chrome Canary, Opera, Opera Developer, or Firefox, you need to know where the flags are. You got to go to a bot config in Firefox or um, something colon something, a Chrome or Opera colon slash slash something something settings to like get to the magical secret page for nerds where you can like go in and find the little thing and turn on experimental web features or turn on grid. Um, there's blog posts about that, uh, links in my talk about how to get there. Um, or, uh, and you should know that all of this is work in progress, although it's like 85% done. But if you go to something like Chrome, some of these examples might not work as well, but if you go to Chrome Canary, the certain specific more advanced features that are necessary are in Chrome Canary. Or like uh, Firefox Nightly has the most advanced version of Grid. Firefox Developer Edition is about six weeks behind. Firefox, the real version of Firefox is like 18 weeks behind. So the newer the browser, the more experimental the browser, the more Grid will work. Um, it's not because there's anything wrong, it's just because of how, that's how it works. It's gonna get made and then it's gonna get shipped. Um, but the day that it gets shipped, 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 where like normal people have access to it, is the day that the browser vendors simply turn it on. It's there already. They just have to turn it on. Um, and it's not been turned on yet because it needs to be 100% finished, and it's like 85% finished. Um, Edge and Safari, we don't really know. It's in Safari Technical Preview and all the work's being done. You know, there's not really any way to know what Apple's intentions are for shipping it. And if Safari doesn't have any way to turn on a flag, so you can't turn it on in Safari now, that's fine. Just check it out in Safari Technical Preview. Um, Edge has uh, an old version of the spec because this spec grid was actually invented by Internet Explorer. Uh, and it's in IE10, but it's an older version that's in IE10, and that version is behind an MS prefix. Um, there's no grid gaps, there's no auto flow, there's like a bunch of stuff missing. So if you're using sort of the most rudimentary version of grid and you're not using any of those things I just rattled off, then you could prefix it and get support back to IE10 and 11, and, uh, but I don't know that we'll want to do that. And, you know, maybe we will. I would first advise just don't use the prefixes. Pretend that it's not an IE. Wrap your head around it and later come back to that question. Um, people also ask, is there a polyfill? And there is a polyfill, but I do not. Oh, that, don't use a polyfill. Just let people have a different layout. Um, but check out Firefox Nightly. Um, and it, especially because there's this add-on that my team and I, Potch, uh, Matt Clay Potch and I made this add-on. Because... Um, Coding grid can be confusing, it's hard to learn, and it, uh, you may not know whether or not like the bug is your fault or where the bug is. Uh, it's much easier to understand what's going on with grid if you can actually see the grid lines as you work. So this plugin puts a little button up in the top right corner and it gives you this little drop down because you'll have multiple grids on a page and you can turn each one of them on and off and you can see your lines and do your work. So. The other question that always comes up is, you know, okay, well, Grid is going to ship. I think Grid's probably going to start shipping in early 2017. It's not coming out in 2016. Maybe just between you and me, January at the earliest. Um, maybe March. Uh, maybe sometime in the spring. Um, and maybe at the later, you know, maybe in the fall. Maybe we'll get two browsers in the spring and two browsers in the fall. Or maybe we'll get three browsers in the spring and one browser in the fall. Um, but I do think that by the time we get to the end of 2017, it's going to be in the four major browsers. Um, and, you know, I don't know, 70% of your users will have it, 80%, maybe 90% of your users will have it a year and a half from now, um, which is going to feel really fast. I know that sounds forever, but it's going to feel fast compared to something like Flexbox, Flexbox. But meanwhile, how do you use any of these properties? How do you use object fit? How do you use um, viewport height units when IE still exists? Uh, and I know that trips a lot of people up. They feel like, well, you know, I can't use them. The reality is that uh, a lot of people think, hey, things either work or they don't work. 
I can use them or I cannot use them. I get this matrix here, right? So I want to use it because I want it to work, but IE crushed my dreams. Uh, so if I use it and it doesn't work, I'm going to get fired or I'm going to get covered by bugs, so I'm stuck. I can't use it because it doesn't work. I've got to wait until like IE 10 stops existing, or I've got to wait until this thing's been out for four years. But the problem isn't really IE. The problem is, a, is our idea that this is the, the world that we live in. We don't live in this world. We live in this world. We can use a property and not use it at the same time. It works and it doesn't work at the same time. CSS is quantum. And the kitten unicorn lives in the works and doesn't work box. It's, you can use things today even though they're not completely supported. It's the nature of CSS. That's how CSS works. So you can use shapes even though only maybe 60% of your users have access to it. The other 40% just see a square. You don't have to keep everybody hostage and force everyone to see a square until 100% of the people can see the shape. The shape's better, but you know, so uh, it's fine. <laughs> 95% of the people are going to see that example I showed you, but you know, there's probably 5% of people who use IE that don't have uh, the viewport height unit support. So, all right, they see things like it's 2007. They can live in 2007 if they want to. Only 12% of people have out, uh, the initial letter. Yeah, but the other 88%, they don't know what they're missing. It's fine. Or here, okay, 0% of people have. <laughs> All right, maybe it's silly to ship this now, but you know, when this number stops being 0% and starts being 20% or 40% or 60%, I'm hoping people, most people, most projects opt to go ahead and start using these technologies. I did a whole talk on this and exactly how to write code that will work in this way. Yeah, you can check it out, it's on my website. Um, I also have a talk that I gave last year that um, gets into other kinds of graphic design, other CSS properties that you might want to use. Um, and this talk, along with all of the links for it and slides for it, are also on my website. Um, and labs.gensimmons.com, I've got tons and tons and tons of examples of all of these things where you can see the code and inspect it. And uh, not all of them, but a lot of them, and increasingly more and more of them, are also on CodePen where you can fork them and check them out. I think it's a time for us to be experimenting. It's a time to learn grid. Grid is hard to learn. You're not going to learn it in a weekend. It took me months, uh, in part because there aren't a lot of resources for it, and I think that will be faster for many of us once there are resources, but um, it's an investment of time. It's an investment. Uh, but grid is a CSS framework. Don't go making frameworks out of grid and be like, check out my 12-column grid, grid, grid framework. Like, no. See, finally, the people who make CSS put a layout framework straight into CSS. So learning it is an investment, but it's an investment that you'll use for the rest of your career. Um, and if you're interested, go check out layout.land. It's going to be a space for us to um, make examples and share them with each other and experiment together and play around together. It hasn't launched yet because I've been on the road, but over the winter I'll be building it. You can sign up for an email newsletter to get announcements when it's out and also more information as I start to have it. Um, thanks very much. <laughs>